Greetings and salutations, friends. Uh, today I am here with Mr. Tex from uh, Black Pants Legion. How are you today? Oh, you know, just another day on the wide, wonderful internet. A wonderful internet. Free, at least, for the moment. And you... Free as we're allowed to have it, at least, for the moment. At least, you know, it's, it's something. You gotta start somewhere. Sure. And uh, it is widening up even as we speak, because uh, one of the reasons why I decided to reach out to you is you're, um, you're a big boy in the Battletech community, and a lot of my fans in the 40k community in general are starting to look over in your direction and going, yeah, maybe giant robots isn't so bad. Well, I'm humbled by that, at least to serve in this modest capacity as somewhat of an informal uh, ambassador for the setting. I was once a Warhammer 40k fan as well for many years, but Battletech was always the first love. And when I saw 40k turning in ways I no longer appreciated, I turned my sights back to the original Stompy Robot game for me. I'll leave, of course, a link in the description down below to uh, Texas' channel. It is awesome, and you should definitely check it out. Because uh, we all need some alternatives now. So how, how did you come to um, end your romance with 40k, then? I was a 40k guy in the years in which I would consider 40k to have peaked. That is to say, the golden years of Andy Chambers where Andy Chambers came in and just started saying, you know what, it would be cool if these battles were determined by the fans. You know what, it would be cool if the story more moved forward and we added all of these additional elements. It would be cool if we introduced additional model lines. Under Andy Chambers' tutelage, you get, like, the Tau, you get the Grey Knights, you get uh, the magnificent goddamn game that is Battlefleet Gothic. He creates and writes and does all of these wonderful things and then in 2004, he gives me like his love letter, which is the chapter approved, which introduced the goddamn Imperial Guard Armor Company, which is, you know, is the highway to hell for fun times and people who have too much money to build 12 Lehman Russes. And also a, um, a, a particularly vile curse word for those people who decided I just need like two or three las cannons in my army, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But so it was good fun. And that was the end of the heyday because Andy Chambers moved on and you started to see the world stagnate and you started to see ultramarines become ultra important. And you started to see some really dumb shit start crawling out of the woodwork. You start seeing multi lasers in certain books a lot. <laughs> We're, we're but, starting to enter spiritual liege territory. Right. And so with the advancement of spiritual liege, I started to be priced out of the game. There I am, a goddamn college student, working 60 hours a week at night to be able to afford just to eat. And I have this hobby that I can play with my friends wherever I want. But everyone has to use the latest rulebook in 40K, especially on the off chance that I get to play in a tournament. And, oh, well, you have to buy all 40K models. And, well, oh, we're going to move to fine cast because it's going to be so much nicer. And what we ended up getting was shittier models that cost way, way more than they're worth. And you see all these things happen. I got priced out of the game by not only Codex Creep, which made my army completely invalid, but the two other armies I'd collected not work anymore. And then it was buy new models and embrace the new suck or buy a new army. And I just saw Codex after Codex after Codex. And none of my friends had money for that. We were just college students. And I think if college students, which are on the extreme end of grown-up children. If children cannot afford to play with plastic models because the plastic models cost more than their weight in silver, it's time to walk away. And there's the thing, too. Like, you, br you bring up the whole fine casting things. Um, for those of you who are slightly more new to the hobby, perhaps I'm being introduced through my videos or through the various video games, etc., 
the whole fine cast thing was marketed to us as like, oh, this will be amazing. This will be so much easier to make our models. It'll be so much easier. It'll be cheaper. And you'll see all of the savings. <laughs> Lying sexist shit. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was it was completely fucking awful. I mean, because the idea was you move from metal models that can get dinged up and bent. Believe me, I had a fucking Steel Legion army. So don't don't anyone ever complain to me about getting a army model ready. I had to file with gunsmithing files my Steel Legion army to make it look presentable because I'm not sure what metal they made it out of. But it was softer than any metal known to man. So it was <laughs> awful. I, I, it was again. It would you know no, the heat you could leave your steel legion in the back window of your car, and when the sun hit the metal, it would expand a little bit and it would crack the paint off of it. That like if you find old painted steel legion guys that someone has left, the metal was so soft, it was fucking awful. It's it's genuinely terrible. I remember I had the uh, the old Chaos Dreadnought, and within like a week, the the little flagpole that had snapped off. Its little fingers oh, yeah. were breaking. Its arms were starting to misshape. Oh. oh, oh yeah, and I mean Battlefleet Gothic only had for some of the larger ships some pewter parts. So like the Apocalypse class battleship, there's not a single one of them in existence that has a single straight angle in it. <laughs> Was... I mean, this and, and that thing cost forty five dollars back in two thousand three. Yep. Like it was, it was expensive and it was awful quality. A lot. Oh of yeah. It. And and so then Finecast came out and we get these things with big, big, big casting marks on them and big bad bubbles in them and some of the early ones melted when you painted them. I remember those threads back in the day. Like what the fuck? My paint doesn't work. Um, and the, the thing was, is they, the price just got more and then the model sets contained fewer and fewer things. And if you think I'm full of shit, if your audience thinks I'm full of shit, I, I recommend you go find PDFs of old white dwarfs and look at the advertised price for like a full Imperial Guard box set and all you get and look at what you get now. If you, if you think I'm crazy and I guarantee you, there's no shortage of plastic mines in the world. There's no shortage of rare and precious, brittle plastic. We make plenty of it. This is just one company thinking their plastic is worth more than silver. And that, that was that was always the worst for me. Because again, this was pitched like, oh no, we'll be moving away from metal. It'll be so much better. It'll be so much cheaper. And it's only gotten more expensive ever since. I like, knew. It, was, it was the first great betrayal, in my opinion. <laughs> Well, I knew I knew a poor bastard that bought the whole Raven Guard, and his army like just became non-supportive and didn't work anywhere near as well as it used to. He had the whole Raven Guard. What do you do with that? Well, uh, you do the same as the poor bastards who were stuck with a Warhammer army, I guess. Burn it. Yeah, I mean, and and the thing is, is I've noticed like with this Exodus, because some people think it's just memes, but. Go search eBay right now, and you'll find a fuckload of guard armies and many other things. There's a lot of people who are just tired of that, and they're finally just voting. They're letting go of the things that held them down. I wouldn't be surprised. Because like, to move on to the um, giant pink GW-shaped elephant in the room... What's, of course, driving a lot of new people now to give up on the hobby as well isn't even the ever-increasing prices, isn't even the decreasing support, isn't even the constant releases of the same codex. Because, like you mentioned, we used to get new stuff, Grey Knights and Tau, etc. Now it's just the same constant release every four years. And it's not only that, it's the lack of versatility. If you look at the old guard codexes, you could actually build an army and theme it out of a points list. Like yes. it says, here's how to build the Cadian Apes and Doctrines. Here's how to do this. Here's how to do that. And it was cool. You could have a lot of unique stuff on the field that showed how to like model stuff. I mean, there was no models back then for a lot of the armies, but it showed kind of what you could build and it was encouraging you to kit bash. Can't do that anymore either. 
DW doesn't want you to do that anymore. That's the thing, because that's where we come into the whole copyright thing, which of course is what they're currently doing. As we see choices narrowing, there's a reason for it. They're going after fan animations because they do not want any competition whatsoever right now. And there was also the recent rules where they uh, narrowed down the rules of modifications for playing in tournaments as well, where everything has to be a standard Games Workshop model, and even conversions, even a little bit, like head swaps, might need approval by their judges. That That is just bonkers to me. I mean, <clears throat> for them to be so litigious and so very much copyright focused, I, I have to say this. I mean, and I'm paraphrasing from my own Legionnaires, but they say, for fuck's sake, Tolkien specifically uses the word Eldar to refer to Middle Earth elves. The Adeptus Mechanicus is right from the pages of Mechanical for Leibowitz. The Adeptus Arbites are a 2000 AD street judges with the serial numbers filed off. Which came first, Gene Steelers or Ridley Scott's Alien? Golly, GW, where do you get the idea to have the Imperium space travel monopolized by an insular guild of navigators? Where have I heard that Ruled before? by a god emperor to boot. Wow, a god emperor? Oh, and... From Razor Fist, he tweeted back. He said, "Stole Elric of, or stole Elric and renamed him Malice Dark Blades. Stole Solomon Kane and mm -hmm. renamed him Victor Salt Spire. Stole the Chaos Army and their eight pointed logo straight from the illustrations in Elric Stormbringer." Hell, he so, I mean, lifted you... the entire idea of Chaos. Practically, Control C, Control V. There was um, right. even back in the the really old days of Warhammer Fantasy. There were chaos gods of order and everything, like straight copy. Right. And, and so the thing is, is like, I've had DMs in tabletop that borrowed ideas from everything. They'd watch bad movies, they'd watch action movies, they'd watch romance movies, and they'd just steal stuff and they'd copy and paste it together and change the words. And you would play through it, and you'd recognize little set pieces as nods and homages to this and that. And that's fine. Everyone likes a good meatloaf of quality ingredients and memes, which 40K was. But the problem is, is they started to act like they invented these concepts. Yes. And, and there is this wonderful book that I read once upon a time uh, called The Bibble. And if you read inside of it, there's this thing where the guy says, Nihil Novi Sub Sole, which means nothing new under the sun. In this book, The Bibble was written a long time ago, right? So you figure if 2,000 years ago a guy says, hey, uh, no shit is new, maybe you should stop trying to copyright claim everything. Just my opinion from a book. But the thing that drives me nuts with GW is they have taken such a heavy-handed approach to the worst group to squeeze, which is the community. Yep. That is perhaps the, um, like, that. that is at the crux of it. Because GW has always been a little bit of an overly litigious corporation. They've always had a bit too much of an itchy trigger finger there. And frankly, they've always thought a bit too much of themselves. Again, a company and a setting that borrows so freely should probably tread a little more carefully in the glass house. But now, like never before, they are going after the fandom in a major offensive. They're going after a ton of content creators and even modders for third-party products. Like never before Indeed. have we seen this much of a scorched earth policy. Well, here's the thing that is really strange to me about all that is I've seen this before. And before I, I posit this, I, I will ask, have you seen this documentary called World of Darkness? I don't. Um, I'm only very like surface level acquainted with World of Darkness. Oh, you need to see it because World of Darkness is a documentary about a company a company that starts very humbly with a simple idea 
out of people who are very passionate for building gaming products. And in this documentary, this company grows and grows and grows and suddenly has this smash hit on their hand that brings them riches and fame. And then they grow so big and mighty, but they start to stagnate because they have grown too quickly. And so when they start to stagnate and they find their profits slipping and people starting to look at their ideas and borrow from them here and there, as they borrowed their ideas from their inspirations, they decide suddenly the answer is to take people to court. And at this phase in the company, we shall call this the twilight of it, they take people to court, they make very bad business decisions and partnerships, and inevitably they collapse and are sold out to someone else. It's a beautiful documentary because you see the same thing happen to a lot of small companies that suddenly believe their shit don't stink. Mm -hmm. Precisely. It's, uh, I just, I hate the goal of it. Like, you have done your thing. You've fulfilled your dreams. You have your company. You've created your world. And now you're going to try and pull the ladder up behind you. Yeah, it's it's an interesting way of doing business. Um, I I certainly wish I could speak with anyone in Games Workshop. Believe it or not, I had originally thought about doing Text Talks uh, 40K, and uh, I will never do that now. I mean, ever. <laughs> I, I I will never sweat an iota or a cent for it because. If 40k and I had a very wide orbit for a very long time because of how they treated me, and occasionally I'd you know, look in on it. I would look in to see how it was doing, how it was getting along in life. And I go, oh, wow. Somebody thought the way to make space Marines is to drag and drop a little box around them and scroll up 25%. So space Marine two bigger. Got it. That's cool. Um, neat. Oh, the sky split in half. And now the Imperium's, Imperium's broken like a busted orange. Oh, that's neat. Oh, cool. Robo girly man is back. That's fan cool. And it was easier and easier to let go, you know, because of these things you read, it's nothing that grabs you. You just go, wow, this is very bad deus ex machina over and over and over and over again. And you just kind of roll your head, your, your eyes at it. You see the price of the products occasionally and, you know, you walk away from it, but I'd still had a little bit of love for some of the older lore, some of the cooler stuff. And I'd thought about making the same level of documentaries with my gracious team and their wonderful abilities. And then I started to see how they were treating people of recent. And I said, there is no way in fucking hell I will ever do that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have spent thousands of dollars making custom art getting custom music doing massive lore videos for this company and look at them now like i regret i regret every penny spent like they don't deserve this they don't deserve this this passion this interest this <sighs> dedication frankly like they don't care they're not interested in their own setting even anymore the gathering storm proved that to a T. Oh, the Primarchs are back. How? Magical chess piece. All right. The Ultramarines are allied with the Eldar. Excuse me. They've launched a massive crusade to retake the galaxy. All right. Are they operating in legions again? Yes. Who's leading them? Gilliman. Oh, you mean the man who broke the legion to begin with? Yes. Shoot me, please. Right. And the thing is, and I'm I'm not a sociologist. I I happen to be the leader of a relatively small tribe on the internet. And I, when I look at this sort of thing, why people still support 40K, I think one, the memes are very pervasive and people like memes. Memes are a very simple way to convey an idea or a thought without having to say anything complex. So instead of trying to define why you don't like something, you can drop the exterminatus gif and people get what you're talking about. One, memes are pervasive and people will circulate what is relatable. But two, and this is something a bit more critical, I think that a lot of people got into 40K because 40K is such a wide pastiche of so many things. There's fantasy elements, there's space opera elements, there's dark gothic elements, there's funny elements, there's futuristic elements, there's 
you know, cyberpunk dystopia elements. There's all these things you can get into. It's a little bit of everything for somebody, but they're looking for a place to belong, something to share with strangers and make friends out of it. And if you show them a healthier community that is kinder and better and good in every way, that supports them and encourages them to not only become part of the community, but in turn to teach others and bring them in. If you find a community, whatever it is, if it's Battletech, fine, but whatever it is, it, if you find a good community, that's what most people are out there searching for on this internet. Similar goals, similar mindset, similar beliefs and feelings, similar hobbies. And if you can find something like that and allow people to feel included and be themselves, in a healthy manner that encourages growth and positivity. I, I don't see why anyone wouldn't want that. And if they feel they have that with 40K, I encourage them to look outside of that if they start to feel dissatisfied because ultimately loving something shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be difficult. Indeed. What, what peeves me so much too is I feel like we had all that for the longest time like 40k was to me such an open community i i remember like back in the day whenever there was a fan animation nothing like astartes or death of hope this really simple stuff everyone loved it everyone praised it even if it was something super basic it was so cool because it was 40k and yet now like, um, the, the Death of uh, Hope guy, uh, for example, great person, he had a little bit of a, a mental break because he kept getting, well, a lot of the same hate over and over again. It was like, oh, this isn't as good as Astartes. This isn't good as Astartes. And it's like, why do you care? Why, why, why is that an issue? This isn't the 40k community, I remember. Why well, do you right. attack per, uh, this peer person for creating this amazing thing? Well, you have to understand that, like, the hallmark of the old 40K community, the one I remember, was that we, we all read Turn Signals on a Land Raider, which was mm -hmm. drawn in MS Paint. Yep. I mean, it was, was, it was basic as could be. Yeah, there was stuff like that was doodles were, were j like the hallmark of the community. Doodles and memes and goofy jokes. It's, it, was, it was, hey, you want to create something? Well, that's cool. There was even, um, oh, I think that was a control alt delete comic, was it? Where the base the joke was, how do you know you're near a Warhammer store and you just Space Marine armor save and you see just a wall of three plus, three plus, three plus. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's abs. Old forty k used to be like that. You'd go to a convention or you'd go to a tournament, and everyone would scream "wah." I mean, it, you would meet really cool people. Everyone had a good time, and there wasn't really so much min maxing that you would see in the later tournaments. When I decided to get the fuck out, um, the community had certainly changed. I'm I'm not sure if it was the accessibility of like Dawn of War or successful marketing or what have you, but. Near the end of that, I started to see a lot of cheese stuff where people would just say, oh, yeah, if I, if I go first and I put these guys on the board, you can't deploy and I win. And you would see people do that more than actually enjoy building and collecting something that, that you know, they identified with, which is cool because that's why I like Battletech so much. You can find a slice of that universe and make it your own and be like, yeah, I'm a fucking pirate and live that glorious life. Yeah, I like extreme competitiveness too is an unavoidable consequence of the game growing larger and drawing more people into it. And it's also the changing nature of the setting as a whole as well. A lot of people were very uh, judgmental or negative of the, the seeming stagnation of 40k. Like we had a period of like 20 years where almost nothing changed, but... I was always kind of the guy who warned, like, are you sure you want to actually start doing too much crazy shit here? Because Games Workshop can't write. No. I swear no, to God, no. they can't. I mean, no. Like, in, in all honesty, Games Workshop needs Andy Chambers back to supervise creativity. And then you need someone like Dan Abnett 
who is a professional writer writer because mm-hmm. the gathering storm was absolutely <clears throat> awful and again little more than an excuse to re-release the space marine line to sell you space marines a second time and it's so blatant as well well of I... course but i mean they're doing this on all fronts look at their fucking shovelware i mean there's like it, i sit there and try to swap through news on my phone and it's like hey buy this 40k game for your phone and i'm like oh we've reached this level of callous disregard of your consumer base well that's because and here's my pet conspiracy theory for why all of this is going on 40k has been so close to the mainstream now for the last few years like they can they can taste that general audience money and this is finally their big push to monetize everything to the max to um, re-release the space marines earn a lot of money off that earn a lot of money of increasing their prices of selling limited edition like the indominus box set um then launch of course the subscription service to really hammer home their numbers so that they can get in bed with a big corporation and just send 40k out everywhere the day you say a 40k box set in walmart in target and it's basically like a tabletop risk style game almost with a super simplified rule set that's when we will know that it's officially over like it's not a hobby for us anymore it is a casual consumer shovelware praxis I, I don't think you're wrong on that. I mean, the uh, the thing that I love about Battletech is for the price of one 40K army, we did the math, for the price of a new 40K army, you could probably buy everything a single army or faction has in one go with Battletech. And that's just one game system. It's It's a lot more rewarding of your money. And if you're willing to embrace it on that, it's it's a very easy gamble to make to try new things. Because the more you look, the more you'll find other games just respect the hell out of your time and money. And they're like, oh, you want to build your own models? Cool. Well, here's the rule book. They don't care. Oh, absolutely. And a lot of them has a lot more freedom as well. Um, one example I'd like to bring up is Mantic Games Kings of War, which is in many cases, just Warhammer with a paint job, you can buy an entire Skaven army, the whole thing, with like three Doom Wheels, a massive hero, a bunch of huge figures, and like a hundred, hundred and fifty odd little clan rat dudes for 160 bucks. That's, that's a good it. buy. That's a whole army in a box. Yeah, that's the whole army. Like, you buy that, you're, you're ready. You paint them up, you've got your whole damn army. I mean, uh, yeah. shit, that's, that's, that, that's great. Bucks. No, I mean, that's that's damn great. I mean, I remember back when you could do that with 40K. You could buy an army in a box, and it was like $120, $140. And because the model sucked, and everything was put together very badly. But hey, you covered it with paint, it was fun. It, those paint, were simpler times. on a little green stuff here and there. Say again? Covered in paint, slapped on a little green stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Fill in the sin. Shaved over the worst parts. Hmm, there you go. Kind of looks like exactly. what it's supposed to be now. Hey, I, I, I'm a gunsmith by trade. So when when you find a trouble part, you, you fill it in and sand it down. Or you weld it in and you sand it down. But you make sure the customer never sees it. Yeah, of course. Except if you're a games workshop. In that case, uh, it takes pride of place. Hey, look, what do we can get away with? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, shit, you can buy the uh I'm 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 on eBay just to make sure I'm not I'm not talking out my ass, but you can find the box set right now because everyone sold out because so many people bought the Battle Tank box set. Um you can buy the box set right now for 54 bucks uh miniatures, let's see. Yeah, a uh, whole crap ton of mechs for 50 bucks um more mechs than you'd ever need for 80 bucks i mean and this is listing after listing after listing if you look at the price cost of just buying a damn book for 40k you buy your codex oh wait now i need the main rule book okay there's two books you need oh wait i need dice measurement shit oh it's all gw branded 
And then you, you can come to buy paints. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. That's and... six bucks a pot too for 250 milliliters. I will never get over that. Yeah, and it's it's like when I saw that, people were like, oh, what kind of paint are you going to use for your army? And I said, spray. <laughs> yeah. See, I literally just get like hobby paint from a hobby shop and it's like, okay, I can buy all the paint I need for like 10 bucks instead of paying that 10 bucks for two pots. Well, right. And what they're doing is so fucking crazy to me for this one reason. And, and I, I will tell you the definition of crazy. The definition of crazy is them sticking to their guns on pricing practices when there is literally the technology to, in your own home, make infinite of the same product for dimes on the dollar. And yep. I, I, I thought about that in my head, and I thought it would be interesting if, for example, there were an altercation uh, with a foreign nation that produced oil. And this nation says, we will cut you off from our oil. And we go, well, that's interesting because we just discovered this way to make your own oil in your own home. So buy. That would play out on any scale you want. If you can make your own better at home just the way you want, why would you ever buy a product, especially one that is from a company that just wants to rob you? Absolutely. And, and that is another reason, too, why right now they are absolutely, in my opinion, moving away from the tabletop. They want to transition their setting over to an IP so that they can sell it. They can sell video games licenses, they can sell the toys, they can sell the live action shows, they can sell all of that. They can sell subscription services because they know 3D printing technology is coming. Hell, it's here now, but it's kind of finicky. It's kind of difficult. It requires a bit of knowledge. Give it another 5-10 years, you can probably have a machine in your home with a little web browser on it. It's like, okay, uh, this. Oh, yeah. this so you're thing. saying like uh, the Steam Workshop version of it. Where Basically, you, yeah. You, yeah, yeah. You want the Star... You, I know you. You want the Star Trek replicator. You want to be like, <laughs> replica, Warhammer, Titan. Uh, and it's like, what? Faction. And you're like, ah. Uh, <laughs> and it just starts printing it out. Yeah. The thing is, again, we are not that far off. I've got um, five, five 3D printers in the basement for the, co the company, family company, which we use for the electrical part of our uh, robot tool changer. It produces these things so much easier, so much quicker than we could even do in our CNC machinery. It's just, it's just easier. And I see the amazing 3D printed models some people are making. Literally, the only barrier right now is the ease of use, because it does require a little bit of finicking. It does require a little bit of adjustment here and there, you know? Yeah, you, you got to calibrate those things to get them just right. Mm-hmm. But the moment that starts becoming more user-friendly, we are going to see the explosion. And GW just... <sighs> I, I'm, I'm assuming it's just cold, hard, cunting hubris at this point, honestly. Oh, yeah. Where they will just well, refuse. Mean, it's one of those things where you can tell, you can obviously tell when someone cares a great deal about what they do, even if what they do is simple or demeaning in your eyes. You can tell if someone cared. And sad to say, with my experience with Games Workshop, they don't. And what's great is we live in this society. Yes, we live in a society. Someone's just going to clip that. But we live in this society where we, each of us, are empowered with shares. Shares in everything. Ecumenical shares of stock, and it's called money. And what's funny is if I don't like a product or a corporation, I can choose not to transact business with them. Now, what this can do is this flight of cash or influx can very easily, very, very easily remind a corporation that perhaps they are not doing what is in the best interests of their financial future and or protecting their IP. And like any corporation, uh, the bottom line is typically what matters. And if you want them to stop doing something, all you have to do is remind them of what that bottom line is. 
Absolutely. Though, again, here is the thing. Like, a general boycott of any hobby is always going to be difficult. Because people have so much invested in it, so much love in it. Which is why I, I would repeat my argument again that if you at least want to do something, just don't get Warhammer Plus. Because that is what they're moving towards more and more. If you can at the very least send them a clear message that, no, we don't actually want you to leave the tabletop market, screw you. We, we would like you to keep producing plastic miniatures, thank you very much. That'll do something. And I think it would also, I mean, you have to look at how other large media corporations handled this. I mean, look at Paramount. If Paramount detects someone making a Star Trek fan film or anything else, Paramount will say, hey, are you a nonprofit? And they go, yeah, we're not trying to make money on this. And Paramount says, cool, you can do whatever the hell you want. You can use the sound effects, the soundtrack. You can... Oh, yeah, do you need to use the set? I mean, they don't care. They want people to make fan films. They want that community, the Trekkie community, to love them because they realize that's what's kept them alive since the show went off the air in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And even better, you've got, for example, Valve. Because here, here's, th here's the thing, too. I firmly believe that these people should be allowed to earn money from their creations. So long as you make it clear, okay, this is unofficial, you know, this, we have nothing to do with this with the main, uh, main company, but we've got a little Patreon, we've, we're going to run some ads on it. And Valve gives people, modders, access to their whole database from Dota 2 and says, here, get crazy. We're going to give you the animation sets, we're going to give you the models, make it something cool. And we'll give you a cut, and we'll put it up on our game as a skin. Like, fantastic. Right, and that's that's fine, because you see other communities do that. Um, I believe War Thunder does that. I, I think quite a few communities will say, oh, if you come up with a cool skin for a jet or a tank or whatever, we'll cut you in on it. We'll, we'll give you some recognition. We'll give you some a lot of in-game money or you know free time in the game or whatever. But it's a collaborative process. It rewards creativity and it encourages community action. And that's kind of what you want. You want a community that creates fan films and fun things and cosplay and all of these things that show they love this and they love sharing it with other people. And it's all fun. I mean, and if it's not fun, you shouldn't do it. And at the certain point of like where 40k is, if I was making mods and GW came down and started beating on my wall because my hobby makes them upset, I would tell them to fuck off. That is, uh, that is the ideal solution. The problem is too, it is a, a big... It, a lot of the actual genuine problem here, which is, of course, obviously beyond the scope of GW to do anything with, but copyright law is a weakness of this, because we do have the ruling that you must protect your copyright, which, to be fair, also is something companies entirely ignore 99% of the time. Disney doesn't yeah. want to protect their copyright against every Dick and Sally who does anything Disney-related, because it's pointless waste. Not to mention, again... Somebody does a Star Trek thing, somebody does a Dota thing, a Battletech thing, a 40k thing. Free advertisement. And it doesn't hurt the company in any way, shape, or form. And, I mean, it's, it's like the Napster argument, right? Where they say, oh, you know, music pirating is destroying the music industry. And then you look at record profits and you're like, really? Where? Then I look at the record industry and it's like, hey, you give your artist like 40% of the total money, do you? Who's destroying who again? Exactly. And it's, it's one of those things where if Games Workshop was very interested in managing and selling this IP off or what have you, they're not being very attractive even in a financial sense because they're engaging in practices that would be more in line with someone like Fox or Disney. Even I then, Fox and Disney they know, have, are not um, litigious to this extent. I know. I'm assuming they have the short-term idea here. Basically, they'll, they'll big themselves up 
they'll be able to show like, look, we've had three, four, five years, lots of growth. Uh, we've got all of this stuff coming out. We've got a subscription service. We're the only ones doing this. And I think that would be potentially a very persuasive argument to a lot of these large companies. And the question is, if they then take the extra bother to kind of like peek underneath the surface. And there's also the question, are they going to get away with it? And I unfortunately think probably yes. I suspect that a lot of the outrage that people are feeling right now is because it just happened. Give it six well, months and I don't know how many people will remember. Well, here's the thing, and I, I know I often use as a seg, here's the thing. It's a bit of an OCD tick, so do pardon it. I do the um, same thing. Yeah, everyone's got their ticks, but uh, what what really strikes me is people forget quite quite frequently, and this is where I get to lean back on my very mal-used historical credentials, but if you look back in history, especially media, you, you look back at stuff like what was the number one sci-fi in the world in like 1940, and you go, oh, well, Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon was the shit. Nothing can beat Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon was everywhere. Kids had Flash Gordon shirts. Kids had Flash Gordon lunchboxes, Flash Gordon on the radio. And then, you know, Star Trek comes along and people forget about Flash Gordon. And then Star Wars comes along. And Star Trek kind of endures because they built a good community. And Star Wars endures because it has a wonderful community for the most part. And then, which sadly betrayed in the latest movies, but that's another discussion. But you find that every so often in sci-fi, somebody comes along with another goddamn great idea. And you, ha you are a fool to try to grab onto everything you can and think it, the whole sky belongs to you. You're not Genghis Khan and you can't just write people over. This is a hobby. It shouldn't be war, but they're treating it like one. And it's because they figure that they can stop Oh, the clock, really. And there's been... They might be right. That's the thing as well. Because you can look at companies like Disney who have literally, well, litigated themselves into positions of near unrivaled power in the entertainment industry, where they're allowed to hold on to copyrights far beyond what they should have been. Copyrights that, of course, most of them they don't even should have been able to own, like Snow White and the Seven Dwarf. That's not a Disney property. That's a fairy tale. Uh, Beauty and the Beast, etc. But we see now these incredibly powerful and large corporations, by which comparison GW is a mere baby, that can kind of just keep going, and they can even bring back and profit off the old stuff as well. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a Flash Gordon remake just modernized to the extreme. Because... I don't know. You, you can't get rid of Brian Blessed. I mean, come on. Oh, you say that. They could get rid of He-Man for He-Man. I'm sure they could. I, I know, I know, I know, I know. But I, I, I want I want Brian Blessed. Hawkman, dive! The best line in cinema history. It is good shit. I, but still, I think that's kind of what they're thinking. They're going to be the exception. Because they might be. With the internet era, it's so much easier to create their own little pocket of monopolies because everything is out in the open. Um, they can they can strike fan animations. They can prevent the community building they don't like whilst also creating the pretense of a community. I was really positive with the whole um, Warhammer community Twitter accounts for a while because I was like, oh, good, Games Workshop is finally talking. They're giving us, like, news and rumors and shit. Finally, some communication. After several years of this, I just see another marketing venue now. It is the pretext of a community. It's like, hello there, fellow fans. Purchase this for four ninety nine. Yeah, no, no thank you. I mean, I that's all I see Twitter as for anymore. I mean, all I do on Twitter is shitpost. I mean, I just shitpost prolifically. And I see people going on there who are like, Oh yes, I uh, I I made my head bigger with one simple trick, and I'm like, yes, hello, fellow influencer, please go away. It's it's really sad. It's fairly <laughs> dystopian, um, because I, I, I hope you're prepared like for that. a Shadowrun dystopia because you're in one. <laughs> 
Oh god, yes. Like This has been a bit of a running joke of mine for a while now that we're heading toward cyberpunk dystopia. As I, as I look at Google being like, hi, uh, we own like everything now, and 98% of the searches on mobile phones is directed by us. Like, hmm, if you told me the moon was made out of cheese, the moon would be made out of cheese, wouldn't it? And Google just sits there nodding. Yes. Don't, don't question friend computer. Oh, that is... Mm. See, you're tempting me now to get into a whole scree on big tech, but that's somewhat off the topic, I suppose. <sighs> the question is if Games Workshop can manage to fulfill their next dream, though, to join the ranks of the Googles and just sit there atop their pile of money and licenses and just give us the occasional plastic miniature at triple the price as a memorabilia. I think that, I mean, if you look at it, how some game companies end up, again, I, I really like that World of Darkness documentary. Um, you see a lot of these companies end up being one guy in an office auctioning off IP and property rights to whoever will pay him. That's typically how these companies end up. Just IP in an office and lots and lots of contracts trying to make what money they can from what memories they harvest. Yeah, that's the thing, too, because it's sad to say, but we are kind of in the twilight hours of 40k. We're in the position that Star Wars was before they you know, made the last couple trilogies, where people still like, well, this is good, right? This this is still good. We can We can maintain this, even as you see the writing on the wall becoming ever clearer as the company themselves are pretty much just, yeah, no, we're, we're in the business of selling memories now. We're going to prey on your nostalgia. Well, and it's, yeah, I mean, you're not wrong on that. The, the way I kind of look at it is I, I think, for the most part, while I am sad to see 40K go this way, I've just opted to throw into better communities and enjoy myself. And to conduct myself as best possible to help as many others who wish to join me on this full exodus one road I have already traveled long ago, and I can say I'm much happier for it. There are broader horizons out there, and all you have to do is walk. There are new settings, and at some point you do have to move over to them. See... I I have a strong temptation to speak to you now of the gospel of gatekeeping, but... <laughs> well, there's an interesting thing on gatekeeping, because there's both sides of the argument, right? The N plus one rule. Mm -hmm. So, for example, let's say you have a, a nice little diner in your hometown that makes your breakfast just the way you like it, you know? And it, it, good coffee, good service, reasonable price. You can always get a table. And then some big influencer comes in and shoots a restaurant. Let's say it's Guy Fieri, right? Diners, drive-ins, and dives. And he comes in and shoots some fucking episode there, like stuffing himself like a pig. And then all of a sudden, your favorite local restaurant is jammed full of thousands and thousands of people waiting to get in there. And you can't get a room day after day because there's no room for you anymore. And it's moved on. By the time you can finally get back in your favorite old haunt, you find the menus changed, the help has changed, the theme has changed. The and it's attitude all from of the people who work there, the people who frequent it, everything is yeah. changing. Right. And I've seen this happen time and again. So there is somewhat of a philosophy I can understand where you want people to come into your community with the right heart and mindset to enjoy it the way you do and to be respectful and mindful of your traditions and culture, especially in stuff like, you know, tabletop, D&D. &D. That has a very established culture, and here's how you do things. You don't throw tantrums at the table. You're respectful to the DM. All decisions are final. You want people to know that before they approach their first game of Dungeons and Dragons. And the same I expect for people trying to get into battle tech. Um, and I, I wish to be as best I can an ambassador for that idea to have people come in and understand that, hey, I know you love 40K. This is different. 
and you, you want people to embrace new things with kind of a more open mindset until they can figure it out and then decide where they want to go. Yeah. See, the, my idea of it really is that there needs to be a certain standard. Like, you do have to have certain rule sets. Like, no, no, this, this is how our setting is. This is how it is always been. We have all agreed on this. We all like this. And we're probably not going to be changing it anytime soon unless you can give us a convincing in-universe reason for why we should. Well, right. I mean, the idea of 40k is it's predicated on all of the horrible dystopias are true at once. And it's a pastiche of all the, you know, grim, dark... uh end of space opera and that's great but the problem is for me it's it's kind of hard to retain me as a consumer of something like that because i like star trek because it's noble bright you see people overcoming things so like hard decisions matter and there's actual moral quandaries um whereas 40k is like okay who's getting shot in the head today you know or like who which, which giant demon am I going to try to bayonet? I mean, it, it gets kind of repetitive after a while. And that ceases to engage me, really. Um, and that's just me. That's that's personal opinion. But when people do come into that community, whatever you enjoy, yes, there should be agreed upon rules and commonalities, culture and kindness. I mean, you want people to be good guests until they decide they want to belong. And if they do, you want to see them treat people with the same respect you were treated and to pass that on to others in a meaningful way so as to continue this excellent thing that you enjoy. I absolutely agree. It's, it, it is the ideal setting, isn't it? It's what I was um, hoping we could maintain with 40K, but it's a lot easier said than done, tragically. Oh, I agree. I mean, there's a quote by a man named Winston Churchill. Uh, if you're going through Little hell, known keep going. Brits, yeah. yeah. If you're going through hell, keep going. And it's it serves me well. So, I mean, yeah, it sucks that 40K has become this. But, you know, you can move on. And is I know there's a lot of creative people out there who are finding this barrier to creativity in the 40K fandom being unnerving because they want to write a comic or they want to, make a movie or they want to share their hobbies and passion. And a lot of these people don't realize that they could make something wholly new and unique. They could create the next great IP. They could reinvent and remix things. I mean, shit, Pathfinder was more or less a bunch of homebrew rules to keep three, five going. And now it's a recognized and wonderful product of tabletop. You too could do that. I mean, shit, Zweihander is a remake of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. There's a lot of stuff out there. If you guys love old 40K, I encourage your fan base to get together and say, let's build our own with Blackjack and Hookers. No, absolutely. Like, creativity has been a dying art for quite a while. And in part, I entirely understand and sympathize as well, simply because you are now in a position where... Warhammer could borrow heavily from everyone around it. If you try to do the same now, you might get a lawyer knocking on your door. Like, it's scary to try and make your own universe, and not to mention the amount of, of work, of effort, of time, money, investment. There, It's a high barrier to entry. It's not like in the good old days when a bunch of random dudes from Nottingham could set up a shop and be like, hey, we're making miniatures now. Well, here's here's where I think is an idea. And this is just one thing I'm going to float out there. I see I'm a person with pretty bad post-traumatic stress from working as a 911 operator. And I, I uh, you know, I, I have a lot of anxiety and depression. And the way I fight those terrible internal feelings is by using my art as a weapon against this darkness in my life. It's It's not an escape. It's my most powerful weapon I could use to lay something down and feel good about still being around. And it's critical for me to have that. And if you find you're in pain, you'll find you can create some amazing thing. And so 
For people who feel betrayed by all this GW shit, I say fucking use it. Make your own stuff. You could make the next 40K just by being mad because the barrier to entry is fairly low, I think. Because, yeah, a couple of guys in Nottingham start making miniatures, sure. But what if you had a miniatures group that was building their world in a giant PDF cloud they all collabed on? And then they said, oh, you want to build an army? Here's the STL files to print those out. And uh, we'll just charge you a $15 license for the army. I bet you'd make an ass load of money. Oh, absolutely. Like, spoiler alert, I, I have actually taken your advice quite some time ago, actually, and started work on my own very early setting. Because I did also see the way the train was currently going. And you do have to try. And who knows? Maybe I get nowhere. Maybe I get somewhere. But you do have to try at some point. I think that no labor is wasted. And I think that if you build something, and let's say it even fail, let's say it, it fails miserably, but let's say that that effort is valiant and it inspires someone else to try and they create something, you, you find that no spark you strike in these labors is going to remove you from your capacity to create. And as well can be a wonderful light to other people. You'll find other people suddenly are attracted to what you do because of how well you do it. And you will find that when you start creative, and you fall into your happy place of creation. You find other people suddenly join you. and They start marching with you in your act of creation. They want to support, if not financially, if emotionally. And if not emotionally, they, you might find an editor. You might find a sound guy. You might find all of these people as a band of misfits. And before long, you have a company. It's not hard. I mean, I've, I've more or less done this with the Black Pants Legion, and I'm humbled by it. But all you have to do is you don't have to succeed. You just have to try. You do have to try. You will never succeed if you don't try. And now, again, even if you fail, so what? Yeah. I mean, so in, in, in the, worst, the worst case scenario, right, in any of my risk assessments is, is like, will it kill me? And if the answer is no, I'm probably pretty game for it. I mean, it, if, if it's a few ticks removed from Kill Me, there might be some hesitation. But the older I get, the, I'm like, eh, what? Fuck it. Roll them dice. Bring it on. And we can all learn from every mistake, too. Ah, uh, See, I do think that is a very, very good lesson. The entrepreneuring spirit is a valuable one and something that more people should embrace more and more often. Though, again, understanding that, that you say it's not difficult, I say it's bloody difficult. Oh, it's, I say it's, it's a lot of work. and I, it's, It can it's be. Worth it. It, it, it certainly can be, but I'm one of those worst cases of workaholics where if I'm working on something, even if I'm putting, I mean, shit, we put upwards of 2,500 hours into a single text talks battle tech. And that's across the team. We put in months and months and months and months fine tuning every detail because we're just obsessive over this shit. And in all of that, even though that is such monumental work, we do not regret it. And it doesn't feel weighty to us. It's in fact joyful. I mean, there are some days where there's slow days or dark days or rough days, but we know what we create in the end makes people happy and it makes us feel fulfilled. And thus, it is a labor that actually makes you feel lighter for it, not worn down. Because in the end, you're also working for yourself and your own creativity, which is wonderful. You need to be able to, how do I put it, to love your own labor. Like, if you can look back at it at the end of the day and say this was worthwhile, this was time well spent, then that's a success, frankly. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Because there's been stuff I've made that just I, I thought was hilarious or great, and no one cared about it. No one watched it. And I thought it was great. And I learned from it. I go, well, maybe this was a funny for me. This maybe would have been better as a private inside joke to a few friends. But... 
you learn. I mean, it's, it's like running a restaurant. You read your bad reviews. And if you find people are consistently miserable with something, maybe you can learn something there and learn it as a, just a beautiful growing moment. And there is YouTube in a nutshell as well. You have a great idea, like, I'm going to make this. This will be super popular. Nobody cares. And then you make another yeah, thing. Well, and I'll yeah. just put this out there and people are like, oh, this is fantastic. Oh, I see. Well, I find the same thing. I mean, it's it's kind of like I'll, I'll sit there with my team and we'll put something out that is a two-hour uh. deep dive on lore with custom art, soundtrack, everything done as beautiful as we can make it, even animations and um, just a beautiful labor of love. And, you know, it, it'll get less traffic than, like, some guy heating a knife in a microwave or something. Um, because, you know, that, that's YouTube. Uh, that's, that's YouTube. That is YouTube. You, how does it feel to know that you are being outcompeted by a metal press squashing oranges? Well, to be honest, I really like watching the metal press. I'm not going to lie. I, I'm a, I am absolutely a fan of people crushing shit because I deep inside and we barely restrain five-year-old with access to a machine gun oh that is lovely though but that that is well, I mean, that is youtube yeah. it is um it is the ah, god i love youtube so much i like the idea of it though the current iteration is perhaps slightly different but the idea that everyone can start making the videos whatever you like doing you can start doing it, and maybe you can even get an audience out of it. Maybe you can even make a job out of it. Even something as seemingly repeated as somebody crushing pennies with a hydraulic press is actually one of the most popular channels on the site. Like that's well. Fantastic. Let me let me ask you a question though. Just just to break up your argument, just for the sake of humor, would would you would you turn your nose at the opportunity to crush things with a hydraulic press and make money doing it? Probably not. No, I wouldn't either. Dude, I, I can think of 10,000 things I would crush right now. Like, right toaster. Oh, oh, but it would have to be plugged in first. And that's the beauty of it. Right? People, oh, yeah, but, if, yeah. if people like it, it has an audience. Oh, yeah, and that's really what YouTube... I mean, just to give you an example... Um, I I had a job once where we had to wear pleated pants, which are very 1950s, and I think they suck, but we had to. And the problem was I'd never ironed pleated pants before. So I went on YouTube, and I searched, and how to iron pleated pants, found a video on it. Here's a guy expertly showing how to iron pleated pants. A few months later, I go search around how to you know, disinfect this sort of wound, how to find what this means, what is how to find your ancestors using the search algorithm. There's all of this wonderful access to knowledge. And I mean, yes, I'm speaking hyperbole on some of those for some measure of modest comedic effect. But the thing that I find so very interesting is that YouTube should be this conduit or portal through which you can access anything you want. It is an infinite television in infinite dimensions across infinite space. And yet, why does it show me so much crap? Well, that's because YouTube's recommendation algorithm hasn't been functioning since uh, 2012. And that's the crux of it, isn't it? The thing is, the... um. I used to have a YouTube contact person before they decided I was a very bad boy. And I had a lengthy, very interesting conversation with this person who basically explained to me, because I was like, why the hell is the algorithm so awful? Why does it show me, a primary like military history aficionado, why, why do I get a Bulgarian TV show? And she's just like, we don't know. We, we figured, okay... We want people to watch lots of YouTube, obviously. People love watching YouTube. And we want to give you the new cool shit that you want to watch. And so they made a simple algorithm. Oh, you watched this documentary on the Tiger Tank. Cool. Would you like to watch this on the Sherman Tank? And that was perfectly functional. But send some smart-ass bastard thought. But what if I added on one data point on top of that? 
and then another data point, and then another data point, and then another data point, until right now the algorithm doesn't even know what it's looking for. You search for metallic press, and it's like, would you like to watch ASMR? No. I mean, that's a really weird ASMR, but sure. <laughs> I've seen it. I, I have seen it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> ASMR hydraulic press, so it's it's just like, all right, I'm turning on the press. And then like 180 decibels. <laughs> oh, there. that's too wild. That's no, 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 that's, no, that's just, I mean, think about it though. Um, if you told young you, little you, if, if, if adult Arch told little Arch what the world was like, I think little Arch would say that is a horrible dystopian sci-fi because we have, dr we, we have drones that deliver packages from a company that's so big it has a space program. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've really reached crazy when we have infinite TV and there's still nothing on. Oh, God, isn't that the problem? Like, I have this, uh, this uh, dream of mine, right? Because automization is coming. As a person who sells automization, I know how that sounds. But trust me, I know what I'm talking about here. In a in hundred years' time, people aren't going to work like we do today. We need the next industrial revolution, and I firmly believe that a lot of that is going to be entertainment. Just very specialized entertainment. Everyone should make something private, something personal. Personal services, be it YouTube, be it entertainment, be it painting, be it tutorials, yada, 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 yada. So, so what you're saying is kind of like a global gig economy where everyone advertises the one little service they do. And, and you could just be like, oh, I need a woodworker or whatever. And it'll say, there's 500 woodworkers in your area. Here's the reviews. And you click the button and then. Kind of, yeah. And, and yeah. also just the online element of it as well. Like there are fantastic channels on YouTube that shows you literally like woodworking. Or there's one guy who makes crossbows out of just garbage. Or another person who makes sword out of rusted metal that he just polishes up. And it's like, wow, this is insane. Oh yeah, it's it's wonderful to watch a craftsman in their element, someone who just knows how to make metal sing and wood glow. I mean, yep. someone who knows what they're doing is incredible to behold. But with the current algorithm, it singularly fails to do what we need it to do in this market, because the algorithm needs to spread as wide a net as possible, frankly. It needs to try and build a fairly honestly simplistic portfolio of who you are and then give you ideas based on that. They've made it far too complex, which is why it I... takes completely insane twists and turns. Well, and that's, that's the thing is, like, I, I had someone ask me what, what I thought about, you know, ever being famous and and or infamous or or what have you and i'm i'm a very private person i i don't show my face i'm you know very kind of shy and i it, it took a little bit for me to even want to talk to you i i, I retreat off into my own little head because i'm i'm a very shy private person who just enjoys being left alone for the most part and what I've found is, yes, I, I certainly feel that there is a very distorted view of YouTube as influenced by this algorithm because I can never find whatever the fuck I'm looking for, even by search returns, when I know exactly what I'm describing because I literally have a master's degree in metadata. So um, I kind of get a little mad at that, but in the end... I think it's a blessing in a fucked up sense because if you want to do a good job in entertainment, you should do the same job if there was one person in the room versus 10,000 in the room. You should have the same amount of love and dedication to what you do if there's one person in your restaurant or a thousand people in that restaurant because if you do a good job, and you really care, that one person will tell all their friends. And that's how you do it. I mean, I've spread largely through word of mouth, and I don't regret it because I've met some of my closest friends doing this. 
And it is crazy to think that. I mean, I never thought this odyssey would result in all of this attention, but I suppose in the sense of me being a great D minus channel or however you want to grade it with delusions of mediocrity at that, I find myself blessed by having a very supportive and kind and understanding fan base. And I find myself with real connections to people, not some sort of parasocial cultivated relationship or cult of personality. I get to spend time with people and I've come to love a great number of them as personal friends who have helped me immeasurably my struggles through life. And so I find that keeping humble is an end result of being beat to death in this case. It is painful, but perhaps, and just perhaps, and maybe this is my own fear speaking, but perhaps it is what has kept my ego from destroying me. Well, that's the interesting part as well, isn't it? Because my experience was, is in many ways kind of similar. Like, I've met a lot of really good friends over, over YouTube. Though, I go in somewhat more controversial circles than yourself, and I've also experienced how even just befriending someone can actually get you genuine hatred from some groups. Oh, sure. I mean, I've, I've collaborated with people in the past who have, for whatever expressed opinion, um, some level of controversy, and I've had people reach out to me about that and say, well, why did you work with this person or that person or this person or that person? And it's both sides. I mean, oh, this person believes in BLM or that person believes in this or they're an SJW or they're an alt-right or whatever. And I try to explain to people who are upset in that case, I say, I have a professional working environment and I like to create things. And when I work with someone, I have the respect for them to not ask their political opinion or their religion or anything else that they can and choose to hold private. That's none of my business. All I ask for is the desired product produced at the desired time. And that at the end of the day, we part as friends and we can return to this place of business by respecting it. And that's how I kind of approach these things. And I've found a lot of flack by, as you say, befriending or working with one person or another. And I don't understand how that is from an observer's standpoint, anyone's business, but mine and the person conducting it. That's another very fascinating aspect because I love the idea of like theorizing around of things in general. But one of the very fascinating things is YouTube and its place in both the future as a workplace and in the way it creates, like you mentioned, parasocial relationships. That's, I am thoroughly fascinated by the idea of parasocial relationships because YouTube is such a new thing for that. People genuinely feel far closer to a YouTuber than they do, say, um, a celebrity, for example. They, they did oh, incredibly interesting tests on this, where they had a questionnaire, basically, which asked questions like, um, if this person, if you realized this person was cheating on their wife, how would you feel about that? Like a very inflammatory situation, right? right. And almost always they would rank them like family member highest obviously then come celebrities and over celebrities and in under family members were youtubers like people look at us and they feel far closer to us than they do characters on the television and very actually close to people that they know in real life and that goes a long yeah. way to explaining why many people react and a very strident fashion. I, I find personally, I've, I've said this in a lot of my videos or live streams. I, I've said I do not enjoy being the center of attention. I do not enjoy being yelled at or spoken at. I enjoy having normal conversations, and I, I tend to treat people with as much respect as I can muster. 
and I try to sail a very reasonable, somewhat middle road to conduct in these things. But I find, unfortunately, quite a few people who will write me very personal information trying to let me have some decision basis or input into their lives. And often enough, I will chastise them and say, I am really just a guy who creates things and I, I don't know you. That's not to say I don't value you as a human being. And that's not to say I don't wish to know you. It's just that I literally have no impact on your life and you should never, ever, ever place important decision on someone you don't know because that is worse than Vegas odds. And then usually I will link information to what a parasocial relationship is. I will say, this is unhealthy. I mean, I, I do not want people to harm themselves by falling into the orbit of someone and trying to desperately love whatever visual concept they have constructed of my abstract form. And I, I just want people to know that while I do have deep and great compassion, as much as I can muster in my damaged state, I, I really, really dislike when people put that kind of attention on me. I, I really don't, don't care for it at all. It makes me very, very nervous. Well, that's the thing as well, isn't it? YouTube is a very strange place for people to do their thing, to make their product. And, hell... <laughs> I listen to the YouTubers complain here, like, oh, we, we have it so hard. No, we don't. Like, this is just, to me, this is just fun stuff to talk about. To you, it's a lot more serious, of course. Like, and that's what I find so fascinating. Well, because I had no idea about this previously, bear in mind as well. Like, to me, you come across as a very strong person, honestly. Like, you have all of these these things, these private things, but look at what you've built, man. Like, look at what you're doing right now. It's bloody well, amazing. I appreciate that vote of confidence. Not to crawl too far up your ass. <laughs> no, it's I, I appreciate that vote of confidence, but I I saw ego take such a negative place in my life. And I watched many people in my family and people I was close to. I watched them follow where ego took them. And it would encourage them to make very poor decisions. It would encourage them to engage in remarkable humor. And you would see people follow this line of self-belief to the point where it's deluded. They have a sense of ego that they can do no wrong. And thus, every action they visit upon the world is ordained. And I saw the callous disregard for people around them. And I saw that again and again and again in my life. And it was just a constant reminder to keep your head down and to keep mindful that you know you're you're only really a small part of this world and in the end you may not be remembered and such you should conduct yourself as best possible and the odd chance you end up being a footnote in someone else's story you don't want to be oh yeah and there's tax that asshole who didn't loan me five dollars right see there, that's where our philosophies are different too, because I adopt this very um, like out there personality. Like I, I pick myself up a little bit. You know, my joke is Arch is always right, but very ironic as well, because I am aware I make as many mistakes as anyone. But for me, that's my protective mechanism, I guess. Sure. On YouTube. Well, of course. I mean, ev everyone has a protective mechanism. I think down at their you base have level. To have I mean. One. Yeah, you have to. Uh, my, mine is uncontrolled swearing. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's, it's a colorful one, if nothing else. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's when I get mad at work, I'll say, what in the cinnamon toast fuck is going on in here? And people start laughing. And I, I don't realize that I just start swearing and it just spills out of me like a tapestry of curses. It's pretty good. Um, I once, uh, one of my uh, interns actually clocked me at 14 different uses of the word fuck in 30 seconds fuck 
is the best word humanity ever invented. It has such unbelievable versatility, and yet we delegate it to a mere swear word. Tragic. It is so wonderful. It is is it adds such a wonderful sense of urgency. And it, it adds does. a oh, it's it's so good. Like you can say hurry the fuck up and it just it has that extra like I my patience is low. You should move. And it is near universally recognized. There is hardly a nation on earth where fuck is not a universal language. Absolutely. Absolutely. I I, I love that contribution to the world lexicon. It is a good word. Ah, man, this I love this idea here as well, because I talk also on how I want more people to be doing YouTube as as a hobby and also potentially eventually as a profession, whilst also bearing in mind that it is a mental strain and a rather unique one as well. There are certain people who are not made for YouTube at all. And oh, there sure. are others who will take to it like fish in water. I mean, I'm an anti-typical YouTuber in that I'm not a people person, I don't like crowds, and I hate being the center of attention, but I like making stuff. So if a, a conflicted mess like me can make something, I, I think any one of your audience should be just fine. Just fine. Well, if we wanted to be proper YouTubers, we'd, uh, what? Uh, I, d I do love the occasional video of the proper YouTuber. You know, the top five list, heavily edited, jump cuts every two seconds, lots of screaming. Oh, yum, yum. <laughs> Burger King foot ladders. <laughs> Again, dystopia. Dystopia. I mean, on the bright side, when you receive your Mac hand grenade to go off to the Mac vs. Apple Wars, there will be a smiling face staring down at you from the mega monitors. I understand, but I'm more of an HK guy, personally speaking. Ah, see, HKs are valuable, though. People are not. Hand grenades is all you get. Yeah, well, see, I'm hoping that if I accrue enough HK products that when bad things go down, the HK reclamation team will come. And all I have to do is hide under the corpses of everyone who didn't buy an HK product and snag a ride in their helicopter. Ah, there you go. Planning for the future. Good. Indeed. Oh, my. Well, we have uh, we have veered slightly off the topic of Games Workshop. Oh, God, yes, so slightly. but... Yeah, that's that's fine. I mean, in in all honesty, real conversation does this. Otherwise, of it course. would sound scripted, wouldn't it? Yeah, of course. And it's all fascinating stuff. At the end of the day, I'm I'm enjoying myself. This is fine intellectual discourse for what is essentially the middle of the fucking week. Uh, sophisticated, I might I might even go so far as to say. I think we need brandy and cigars, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Except I don't drink or smoke, so screw you. Oh, well. That's I'm pure, sir, you see. Ah, uh, I see, I see. How's that working out for you? Uh, pretty well, everything considered, uh, so far at least. Well, that's good. That's good to hear. I'm hoping to avoid any major, major depressions in my life that will make me rethink my ideas, but uh, otherwise. Oh, that's, I mean, yeah, but I mean, you know, nothing tested, nothing tried. So that's good on you. That's good on you. Ah, well, now we've uh, covered the primary topics, haven't we? And well, how far have we been going? I've lost track. Let me see. I I have no idea. I'm I'm just sitting here relaxing after a long work day. Even took my tie off. Oh, really living on the edge. Living on the edge. I I'm drinking a Dr Pepper, and I've taken my tie off. I, I am the American work hero. The American worker. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's Miller time somewhere, right? Always is. I have uh, been told from reliable sources, the television. Ah, the great father of static. The great father of everything. God, 
I remember a time when I couldn't eat food without sitting in front of the television, and now it's an ancient, long-forgotten relic gathering remember, dust somewhere. Yeah, I remember my family coming up. Uh, in my family coming up, everything was in front of the TV. And when I finally moved out on my own, uh, I didn't buy a television, and I didn't miss it. I was like, wow, my house is quiet. Everyone else's house is really loud. The television used to be an extended portion of most families' digestive systems throughout the late 90s and early 2000s. And yet now, again, why would I need a television? I have YouTube. Everything I ever would like to watch, right there. And if it's not on YouTube, I'm sure it's on some uh, site of ill Russian repute somewhere. Oh, come on. Come on down to Comrade Tutovsky's House of Legitimate Film. <laughs> Legitimate film. Look, DVDR. Do not worry. It's number one film. It's fine. Yes. Cover may not match what's inside, but this is part of experience, yeah? This is Shrek 5. Is is number one. Is, no, 13. One of those. Don't worry. Oh, God, Shrek. Long may it burn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 See, Shrek 1 was funny. Shrek 2 was starting to lose their plot. Shrek 3, and then Shrek 4, and I believe Shrek 5 now. I, I don't I, know I, if anyone you, knew that. You want to hear something to blow your fucking mind? There's like 14 Land Before Time movies. Really? Dinosaur movies. There are 14 of those fucking things. I remember, like, I watched Land Before Time, as in the first one. I had yeah, no I think idea every they kid made 13 did. more. I, yeah, I think every child saw that. And there's like 14 more. They were all direct to uh, tape. Hmm. I didn't need to know this, but thank you. You're welcome. I, I, I know this cursed uh, amount of information. I thought, you know, who should I impart this onto? Ah, Arch. It's unwelcome in the extreme. As now, I find myself Googling images of Land Before Time, and I'm seeing a drastic drop in animation quality. How dare you? They're doing their best. <laughs> it's it's probably like a guy with a repurposed like flip book at this point. You you see like the lines on the page, and it's one guy doing all the voices. Uh, well, at least it's it's one part. It it was one part of my childhood that had remained unsullied, but no longer. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm America's here to ruin everything for you. By the way, how's your oil? Well, actually, our oil's doing fine, thank you. We're still shipping it off to Britain. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. By the way, do you have a navy? We do, except we ran one of them on ground because um, we forgot that it was an island. Oh. Oh. We've got three others, but, you know, we used that oh. one. Oh. Okay, got it, got it. I I'm just taking notes, you know, uh, for, th for the future. No, it's no too reason. cold here for America to invade anyway. So there's, there's, and the worst part as well, we have no infrastructure. There's a single McDonald's <coughs> in Oslo, that's it. Yeah, I mean, and, and I know most Americans, we, we would get lost because they would think it's the North Pole. They'd be like, where's Santa's workshop? Unironically, I have been asked the question by Americans if I know where the polar bears are. And I'm like, well, I guess technically I know where they are, but they're not nearby. Right. So, having talked about everything we wanted to talk about, and a few other topics as well, I, uh, I think that's a good way to end it right there, Mr. Tex, don't you agree? I do agree, sir. It has been a most enjoyable experience. It has. So, everyone should definitely go check out uh, Tex's channel, A Black Plants Legion. Again, link in the description down below. And, until next time, thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.